Okay, a few seconds to go. Right. So good afternoon, good evening to all of us uh, and to you, our viewers and users of our YouTube channel. And let me welcome you to the 11th edition of the European Values Talk. And today we are going to discuss uh, a very interesting study that is related to Georgia. Before I go forward, I know that many of you might be interested in what is happening in Georgia these days, these minutes, these hours. Uh, let me make a kind of a remark that we will be ready to take these questions with regard to current situation at the end of the presentation uh, of our study. And uh, first, let me say that we are going to show you the, uh, I would say, unique uh, research, which is called uh, Mapping of a Foreign Malign Influence in Georgia. Uh, our partners from four Georgian organizations, uh, um, Media Development Foundation, GRASS, uh, uh, DFR Lab, and the Civic Idea contributed to this research. And we have here four speakers from these organizations who would speak about their individual chapters. But we will start with the introductory remarks uh, to be delivered by His Excellency Czech Ambassador to Georgia, uh, Mr. Petr Mikiska, who was so kind uh, first to agree to be with us in this time, and secondly, for that he hasn't changed his plans because now there are some important meetings for obvious reasons in Tbilisi. But he is here with us in order to uh, address us with his welcoming remarks. And the reason why is the fact that uh, this project, this uh, research, was funded by the Czech uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, together with the US aid uh, assistance coming from the uh, Emerging Donors Challenge Fund. So this is a kind of a joint project funded uh, by two important donors implemented by the Czech NGO, uh, our think tank European Values and our four Georgian partners. So let me now pass the floor to uh, His Excellency Ambassador Mikiska for his introductory remarks. Well, thank you very much, uh, David. Good afternoon, good evening. Uh, here in Belize, almost an evening, or we still have some light. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to address uh, participants of this talk. It's my great pleasure and honor to be here. Uh, the Embassy is very proud that we could be part of this research, of this project, uh, supported by the transition program of the Czech Ministry of Foreign Affairs, as you said, and uh, of the Emerging Donors Challenge uh, program of the U.S. Congress administered by USAID. Um, I would like to, first of all, congratulate the European Values Center for Security Policy and uh, Georgian partners. You mentioned them. It's uh, Atlantic Council DRF Lab, it's Civic Idea, it's Georgian Reform Association and the Media Development Foundation. I really thank you all for successful work and uh, to a certain degree disturbing report. Uh, in, uh, in the recent years, in some cases, uh, like the Georgian one, in not so recent years, we can witness the growing influence of Russia and China and in their neighboring countries, in former Soviet satellite, uh, satellites in Eastern and Central Europe, but also in other EU member states and in the US. Uh, this influence has different forms and different intensity. The most visible, structured, and dangerous Russian actions are aimed at neighbors, former Soviet republics. But we can be more than sure that in the case of the success, these subversive tactics will be used in newly established neighborhood, for example, in Eastern and Central Europe and beyond. For different reasons, uh, in some occasions, reasons similar to those in Georgia, Reactions in the EU member states and uh, <clears throat> sorry, and in the EU as a whole are weak, trivializing and even egoistic. But if the free world wants to defend its democracy and freedom, it must support the countries in the front line. Georgia 
is the target of a combination of influences, military and security, political, economic, cultural, mediatic, etc. These influences must be addressed with active action, strengthening the resilience of the population, of the economy, the democratic political environment. I am especially worried about the economy, as the dependence on the Russian and potentially Chinese markets, investments and, for example, tourism, followed with openly hostile and coercive measures reacting to the slightest divergence from the counterparts' plans, directly affect the Georgian economic development and population's well-being. What is perhaps the most disturbing is that uh, it affects the freedom of the decision-making process of the political elites. It's very hard to decide on the political future distant from the Kremlin's vision, uh, Kremlin's vision of the world and the region, if you can be almost sure of the retaliation causing the negative attitude of the voters in next election, as well as uh, of the negative reaction of your own economic players profiting from doing business with Russia, especially in the economic cooperation and uh, access of Georgian production to European markets, I see a very important role of the European Union. Obviously, the European Union and the member states support Georgia in all directions, not only the economy. But I see economy as a crucial point because it's affecting everything else. Uh, the resilience stems from the knowledge of the dimension of the problem. And this is why the mapping research presented by the European Values Centre for Security Policy and its partners, it's so valuable. Uh, but uh, I, I think that it must be followed by concrete and far-reaching measures and policies, both on Georgian side and on the side of democratic partners, Czech Republic included. Once again, uh, David, allow, uh, allow me to uh, thank you for this opportunity to address participants and colleagues, that's uh, what we know, uh, and uh, for the report presented. So let's hope that this talk and the report will contribute to the better understanding of the challenges we are facing together, and especially to effective countermeasures. Uh, you mentioned that uh, uh, there is a meeting ongoing right at this moment, because we have some developments on the political sphere uh, in Georgia. Uh, it was the resignation of Prime Minister of yesterday's court decision uh, about, uh, about prosecution of uh, the chairman of the UNM, Mr. Melia, and uh, European ambassadors are discussing right now our reaction to uh, this development. So uh, let's see what will be our steps, what will be uh, our, our reaction to those. But uh, it's all interlinked. And those two last developments I mentioned are certainly a reflection of the foreign influences as well. So thank you very much again. I hope that uh, we will listen uh, very interesting. And as I said before, also disturbing. Uh, information from colleagues and from the presenters. So I wish you success in this talk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador uh, Mikiska, for your uh, nice speech and for your time. Again, I would like to stress it that uh, finding a time in these hectic days, it's uh, uh, very important. And you mentioned that uh, the next step should be to look at the measures that could be undertaken uh, following these reports. Uh, but first, let us present this report to our audience. Let us present that mapping exercise, uh, what is written there about the Russian, Chinese and other countries' influence. And I have a pleasure to invite our partners from the Media Development Foundation to start the presentation. So the floor is yours. Thank you, David, for introduction. I'm Tamar Kinturash, really representing Media Development Foundation with Michael Ratiani, who worked on religious issues. 
uh, and thank European values for gathering us together to produce this comprehensive research showing big pictures because many of us are working on different aspects of hostile influence, but it's first attempt to cover the topic from different perspectives. So we produced three uh, chapter of this report on politics, religion and extremist groups. And I mean the political influence of Russia. Even topics are different. They're, they are interconnected because some extremist groups became part of political process ahead of elections and it's difficult to uh, separate them from each other. So as our report indicates that the, Russia's highest goal is to achieve Georgia's integration into Eurasian Union, or at least to achieve uh, having neutral country near its border and hamper our integration into Euro-Atlantic um, space. Uh, connections of pro-Russian players and their pupils are not always uh, visible because of uh, occupation of two regions. Even politicians and media outlets supporting Russian policies are not openly declaring their connections or affiliations with Russia. Uh, and Russia itself acts in KGB style in covered ways. And there are limited evidence about connections of certain political parties uh, with Kremlin. Uh, recent uh, investigation by Dossier Center indicated the connection of Alliance of Patriots with Kremlin and their support for their pre-election campaign and another movement, Georgian March, which was part, of, which was an extremist group, uh, became part of political process. And there are some reports by our Estonian friends about their connection with Russia. Uh, so these all parties failed to succeed in this election, but not because their ideas are not supported. Uh, but because of this destructive strategy used by Alliance of Patriots saying that if Russia is occupied, why not Turkey trying to shift focus from current occupation to historical one was applied by ruling party ahead of election. I mean, David Garaji Monastery related investigation ahead of election. Uh, when two public servants were arrested and focus was shifted from the Russian occupation to historical one, uh, providing fruitful ground for extremist groups and pro-Russian groups, saying that uh, they're not only uh, Russia, but other our neighbors like Azerbaijan, Turkey, they are also occupier of our territories. Uh, besides this topic, Alliance of Patriots supports neutrality and direct talks with Russia, trying to present involvement of our international partners in this uh, conflict as an um, obstacle to solve the problem, saying that uh, Georgia sacrificed its interest to Western countries and its contradiction between two big powers like US and Russia, and Georgia has nothing to do with this. And it's better to stay with strong Russia rather than rely on support of Western countries. So uh, Russian uh, narrative is, uh, three, is Russia develops three structured narratives in Georgia. The first one is a fears, sowing fears of losing territories, identity, biosubversion, fears of assimilations. The second stage is sowing fears of uh, and distrust towards democracy and our strategic partner. And the third part is offering co-religious and power, powerful Russia as a solution of all these problems created by Russia itself. Another topic highlighted by pro-Russian political parties in, is construction of Anaklia uh, deep seaport. And I think that Grass will elaborate on this 
economic uh, interests in more de more deeply, but the um, uh, goal and the messages developed in open sources indicate that Anaclia port uh, co uh, construction um, is perceived by Russia as an obstacle of uh, and uh, topic that might be related to neutrality. Only possibility for Georgia to open this deep sea port is to be neutral country uh, and diminish fears of Russia the, about our Western orientation and the presence NATO military presence in Georgia. Uh, this is in brief on the part of politics and Michael will elaborate on uh, religion topic, religious topic. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I will continue and uh, will say a few words uh, about Georgian Orthodox Church, which uh, our mapping research indicated to be a separate tool for Russian influence. Uh, the church does not openly proclaim an official pro-Russian stance. Some members of the church even support George's path toward the EU and NATO after moving to Brussels. But there are uh, only a few of the church members. Some just prefer to stay silent and neutral, but others among who are more high-ranking representatives of the patriarchate often not only disseminate the narratives that coincide with Kremlin agenda, but also make uh, explicit statements that Russia is the savior and Georgia should be in brotherhood with Russia. Uh, there are two main circumstances that raise concerns about the connection between the Georgian Orthodox Church and the Russian Patriarchate, which is a political tool for the Kremlin. First, uh, Georgian Orthodox Church continues to have close relations with the Russian Patriarchate while separating itself from the other Orthodox churches, for example, leaving the uh, Ecumenial Council in 1997 and not attending the uh, Church's Council on Crete in 2016 and so on. And second, a uh, very important uh, factor that um, indicated the influence of Russian Orthodox Church on Georgian Patriarchate was uh, Georgian Holy Synod's refusal to support autocephaly of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church. Uh, besides these uh, two important facts, uh, there are clergy who are spreading Western or pro-Russian messages from time to time. For example, uh, one of Metropolitan stated that Georgia's Euro-Atlantic course must be revised by holding a new referendum. And they, some of them also have linkages to Russia through education. Uh, some of the clergy make visits to Russia. Even the chair of the Holy Synod, Patriarch Ilya II, used to make regular visits to Russia until 2016. And he visited not only the uh, Russian Patriarch, but also the former president of Russia, Dmitry Medvedev, and current president Vladimir Putin. It is uh, also visible that um, Georgian Orthodox Church has um, connections with uh, extremist groups. Uh, among them are some Kremlin-affiliated, uh, also uh, some members of the Patriarchate openly supported pro-Kremlin groups by joining them at rallies or just with verbal statements. Uh, there is uh, also um, ortho Union of Orthodox Parents, radical extremist organization, that was the radical, radical position of the church as some of its members are uh, clergy. So um, basically, this is a brief description of Georgian Orthodox Church actions and connections to Russian patriarchate. Thank you. So I hope you can hear me now. So thank you, David and European Value Center for organizing this event. And thank you, Mr. Ambassador, for being with us today and for your support to this project and to this particular uh, research as well. So I'm David Narushvili from Georgia's Reform Associates or CRAS as we call it. So uh, within the research, CRAS was responsible for, for several chapters or topics 
So in my part, I will try to very briefly explain the findings of the research and give you a flavor of how the foreign actors influence Georgia in terms of uh, terms of uh, non-governmental sector. Sorry, non-governmental sector, ethnic minorities, economy, and intelligence activities. Uh, so while working on this research, our I mean the grass main focus was on and its hybrid warfare arsenal deployment. So let's start with non-governmental sector. In general, Moscow sponsored non-governmental organization and proxy groups are part of the Kremlin's diverse toolkit, which is developed to, to support its objectives in Georgia and, or in elsewhere. And as Tamar already mentioned, one of the main objectives of the Russia is to keep Georgia in its sphere of influence and to hinder the country's Euro-Atlantic aspirations. So since 2008, or since Georgia-Russia war, a number of non-governmental organizations have been established in Georgia, of course, with the support of the Kremlin or Kremlin affiliated foundations. And what's interesting is that some of these organizations have de facto uh, suspended their activities uh, due to the lack of popularity or some results, maybe. But what we are you know, we are observing right now is that some of the prominent members of these organizations have now moved to ultra nationalistic or far right groups and. Uh, and in uh, in contrast to openly programming a non-governmental organization from just to the mainstream and the domestic political agenda and um, in this case alarming is not the number of such proxy or far-right they are followed but uh, most alarming fact is that the government or the authorities have been Supportive to uh, some idea of this year, encourage because they are not marginalized or adequately penalized by the government or, or, or relevant institution in most of the cases. Let's move to ethnic minorities. Uh, as you all may know, Georgia is a multi ethnic country with roughly 10 of its entire population being made up of ethnic Azerbaijanis and Armenian citizens. And there is predominantly populated by those minorities. And one of the main concerns with the minorities uh, is that there is a lack of uh, knowledge of Georgian language among them. And on the one side, uh, this hinders them from full-fledged participation in the public political life. And on another hand, this increases the consumption of foreign information by or among the ethnic minorities. So, uh, as, as practice shows, the most spoken language among these minorities uh, is unfortunately Russian language. So, they mainly get information from Russian sources, and this creates a fertile ground for Russian propaganda and disinformation to, influ to influence uh, ethnic minorities. And as you can see on the chart, there is uh, National Democratic Institute surveys, which shows that, uh, uh, that there is a big difference among uh, among other people and among ethnic minorities when it comes to the support toward European integration and NATO in, uh, integration. And in particular, for example, the support towards European Union is 21% lower than the national average and support toward the NATO is uh, almost twice as less as the national average. So, so as you can see, this um, increased rate of uh, consumption of foreign information, and, uh, especially Russian TV channels and Russian sources, uh, affected, uh, affected, uh, especially affected the ethnic minorities. And, uh, to very briefly uh, uh, review the economic part, despite the economic uh, progress Georgia has made in the last two decades, we can see that the dependence on uh, Russia has uh, uh, has been uh, and direct economic dependence on Russia roughly amounts to 10% of Georgia's gross domestic product. And this dependence is mainly attributed to three factors, which is tourist trade and remittances. And as Mr. Ambassador has uh, already mentioned during the introduction, the tourism is one of the fastest grow growing economic sector of Georgia of the last decade. And as you can see on the chart, the majority of the tourists coming to Georgia uh, are Russian tourists. Uh, and 
course, the picture, uh, uh, the pandemic pictures now, the situation has changed, but we, can, we cannot yet see the new trends. So another aspect or sector is the trade. And as you can see, around 80% of wheat consumed in Georgia is imported to Russia, and more than half of Georgia wheat is imported to Russia as well. And on the next uh, I can see that during the uh, last few years, Russia has been the second largest country for Georgia in terms of uh, export and import. And as you can observe, between 2008 and 2012, the uh, trade with Russia was almost 0%. Of course, due to the war between the countries, but since the change of the government in 2013, you can see that uh, the trade with Russia has uh, started growing and it, it reached its peak in 2019. Uh, and another uh, aspect is remittances. Between 2000 and 2012, money sent from Russia uh, amounted more than half of the remittances, but uh, during the last five or seven years, remittances from Russia decreased, partly because now new waves of Georgian immigrants are going uh, more like the, the top destinations for Georgian migrants are now European Union and United States. And that's why the number of Russian remittances are decreasing. And also Russian companies are owning some strategic infrastructure in Georgian economy, which includes the electricity providers, banks, petroleum uh, suppliers, seaports, uh, hydroelectric plants, and et cetera. And also, I want to single out the nuclear deep, deep support, which Tamar has also mentioned, which I would say was the biggest economic uh, project of uh, of the last two decades. And whether it was Russia who leveraged uh, Georgian government to stop the project, or whether it was poorly to the economic complications, it was a huge blow for Georgian economy to bring a nuclear project to a standstill. Uh, from both from political perspective, which Tamar has also touched already. And last but not least, it's intelligence activities. And among many other activities, I have just selected the cyber attacks as Georgia is very vulnerable towards the towards, towards such actions because Georgian cyber security system is quite weak. And we have seen during last two years, especially in 2019, we have a very massive cyber attack, which was later traced back to the Russia by the help of US and British allies. And another massive cyber attack was carried out uh, in 2020, which aimed to steal some information from Georgia's healthcare system. And they specifically targeted the Lugar Center, which is one of the key components of Georgia's fight against, against coronavirus. So to sum up, uh, this was a very, very brief uh, uh, summary of how foreign malign actors and especially the Russia acts in Georgia in terms of non-governmental organization, economic minorities, and intelligence activities. And I, I, I also want to touch upon the current development, but as we agreed, we can move this later after the presentation, and we will be happy to answer your questions regarding the current political development. Thank you, and I will give floor to the next presenter. Yeah, and before we give a floor to give it, let me uh, also tell our audience that there is a possibility to ask questions to all uh, speakers today. You can find the link to the respective website of Slido under uh, our YouTube uh, video channel, uh, under the uh, video on our uh, Web website plus there is also the link to the report itself uh, david mentioned it that these are just the brief excerpts uh, from the report but the whole report can be downloaded from the link that you can also find under this video so i will now give a floor to uh, Givi uh, from the atlantic council so Givi, go ahead please thank you david and thanks a lot for putting together this event and mr ambassador thanks for joining us today uh, my name is Giri and I represent the um, DFR Lab, as it was already mentioned, and uh, uh, our organization contributed to preparation of uh, the chapter about Russian disinformation. Uh, and together with my colleague Eto, we are going to today discuss the main uh, findings that we include in our chapter. And um, probably um, we should start with uh, key objectives of uh, Russian disinformation in Georgia. And as my colleagues uh, mentioned, probably the primary goal is to uh, obstruct Georgia's integration into Euro-Atlantic institutions and to take country back to Russian embrace. Uh, 
And uh, to that end, Russia tries to instigate uh, negative sentiments uh, towards the West and to undermine trust, trust towards uh, Western institutions um, within the Georgian society. Pro Kremlin uh, actors, as also Tamar mentioned already, also are instilling fears of uh, inevitable military conflict uh, with Russia if Georgia eventually joins NATO. And uh, this is done in a way that uh, Kremlin wants to make sure that for Georgian people it's difficult to make um, kind of a consensus on key principal issues, including foreign policy vector and other things. So they just want to this undermine uh, the possibility of having common ID and consensus on key um, decisions in the country. Um, when it comes to main characteristics of Russian disinformation, uh, the propaganda uh, that comes from Kremlin is produced in quite big uh, volumes and is also broadcasted through multiple channels. Uh, and um, disinformation actors mainly have this belief that uh, if they use multiple um, channels and uh, uh, to disseminate their uh, narratives, uh, it will be more convincing or persuasive for uh, people who are exposed to these narratives. Uh, and we also see that uh, these information actors are constantly um, repeating and uh, recycling um, this information um, in as much as uh, repeated exposure to uh, a statement uh, that comes from uh, these information actors is believed to increase uh, the acceptance of this information as truth. And because of the lack of the commitment to objective truth, uh, these information actors are also try to be responsive to emerging events and they produce this information immediately after some key political events take place or whenever they see fertile grounds to produce this kind of um, information which is like a problematic of disinformation as we call it. and last but not least um we uh notice that the disinformation they produce is not always 100 percent uh, false but sometimes they take a piece of truth and they, they build a disinformation story around this um, uh, kind of piece of truth so that they try to twist uh, different stories. Um, when it comes to the main sources of this information, uh, as you can see, the list is um, quite long and my colleagues um, already discussed uh, the majority of them, but probably I would single out uh, Russian officials uh, including uh, diplomats and the key figures in the Russian government who are um, pushing um, a lot of um, a, a kind of uh, groundless claims towards Russia, Georgia and uh, they um, continuously accuse Georgia of undertaking some anti-Russian um, activities. Uh, also state-funded media such as RT and Sputnik are conveying um, false narratives about Georgia quite frequently. And then we have Georgian media outlets, which are linked to uh, Kremlin and which are amplified uh, those narratives uh, that come from Kremlin funded uh, Russian media outlets. And also my colleagues mentioned uh, some political parties, um, which um, try to achieve some sort of electoral success, but uh, fortunately they didn't really succeed uh, during the last uh, parliamentary elections, but they are also, um, uh, the political forces in the country who are trying to promote Russian interests. And uh, last but not least, my colleague from NDF um, discussed um, some um, instances of Georgian clergymen conveying um, narratives that are um, in line with the Kremlin narratives. Um, and we also have uh, ultranationalist and far right groups uh, in the country, which uh, my colleague Eto uh, will discuss um, more in more details. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Eto Buzeshvili, uh, also representing Atlantic Council's DFR Lab. My colleagues have already covered the most of the part of our research, but I will briefly sum up the trend, the concerning trend that we have seen in the dimension of rising far-right groups and far-right activities in Georgia during the last year. So in the pre-election period, the political situation in Georgia has become increasingly polarized 
which was fueled by various disinformation campaigns and Georgian far-right, pro-Russian and anti-Western political parties and groups have become noticeably active both online and offline prior to parliamentary elections. Of course, they have been spreading anti-Western and pro-Russian disinformation and attempting to mislead Georgian society. Uh, three major trends that we observed during the last year. First trend related to the Alliance of Patriots, the pro -Russia, openly pro-Russian and political party. Um, since the last parliamentary elections in 2016, during which it won its first six seats in Georgian parliament, Alliance of Patriot has been accused of working for Russia against the interests of Georgia uh, by many uh, local as well as international organizations. According to the re recent investigations by Dossier Center, uh, Alliance of Patriots is directly financed by the Kremlin, which is also handling the party's election campaign. Of course, uh, Alliance of Patriots is also known, known in Georgia for its anti-Western xenophobic and Turkophobic sentiments. And this is where I want to draw your attention. The party's Turkophobic disinformation has become uh, extremely concerning. At the end of August 2020, right before the parliamentary elections, billboards from Alliance of Patriots appeared in the streets of Georgia. Uh, one of the banners spotted in the Turkey neighboring Georgian region at Jara, showed the map of Georgian with Ajara marked in red, similarly to the Russian occupied regions of Abkhazia and South Ossetia. So the billboard was an attempt to deceive Georgian society with the disinformation narrative that the Turkey is occupying or plans to occupy Georgian territories. So the Alliance of Patriots has been using Facebook as well to spread disinformation narratives about, about Turkey. Um, uh, and these disinformation campaigns which uh, has been focusing on portraying Turkey as an existential threat to Georgia, is an attempt to distract Georgian atten Georgians' attention from the ongoing uh, and existential threat posed by Russia and influence society's political choice for uh, already uh, hold uh, parliamentary elections. The second trend is the uh, Georgian March. Uh, my colleagues already mentioned this party, uh, the political party, which before was a group uh, the uh, extremist and far-right group, and actually turned into the party for the elections. They have links with Russia, as uh, Tamar mentioned, which was covered in the Estonian Intelligence Service report. Basically, we, learned, we officially learned from Estonians that Georgian March uh, has links with Russia. Of course, everybody knows uh, about that in Georgia. So the far-right party's behavior related to disputed territory between Georgia and Azerbaijan has been extremely concerning. They have been suing the topic to fuel negative emotions of Georgians toward Azerbaijan. So if the Alliance of Patriots is fueling negative emotions and portraying Turkey as an existential threat, Georgian March is doing the same uh, regarding Azerbaijan. And er the same tactics of distracting attacking from Russia in two different dimensions. And last but not least, um, a very interesting uh, and extremely concerning uh, far-right group, Alt-Info. Um, and actually, this, group's, uh, this group belongs to some other far-right groups that attempt to present themselves as a trusted source for news and analysis on Georgia. And in this way, so distrust of the West. Um, so these activities were particularly concerning ahead of uh, parliamentary elections uh, because Alt-Info, the far-right group, started to describe itself as a conservative media platform. Uh, starting in spring 2020, the group has recorded a series of online interviews with and uh, with Western public figures, Georgian Orthodox sir, church representatives, uh, the members of ruling party, etc., etc. So this is a kind of new way to legitimize themselves and to portray themselves as a trusted source for the news. We, we are observing the diversification of online as well as offline tactics and methods. And of course, the last sentence on Facebook, I, I, can't, I can't restrain myself from saying that, um, the, these groups and parties are very active on Facebook. They know that the, the majority of Georgians are on Facebook. They, uh, they receive their daily news from Facebook. So we have witnessed a couple of Facebook takedowns, meaning that Facebook deleted uh, their accounts and pages and groups, which was a really great move from Facebook. But this, again, uh, highlights that Facebook remains the main platform for spreading this information in Georgia. Thank you.
Greetings to everybody and greetings to our audience. Uh, I'm Anikin Zurashvili uh, representing Civic IDEA uh, and I'm going to briefly discuss uh, our contributions to the mapping research uh, uh, which uh, uh, are focused on China and its influence operations in Georgia, particularly in three major domains, um, Academia CSOs, Economic Sector and Disinformation. Uh, first of all, I want to highlight that uh, during the past decades, uh, uh, the Chinese Communist Party has become uh, especially robust in Georgia's civil society and academia sectors. Uh, and nowadays, what we see here is that uh, China is uh, financing uh, different uh, Georgian non-governmental uh, units and educational institutions. Uh, moreover, it is initiating co cooperation with the local uh, CSO, um, CSOs and uh, uh, Georgian universities. Um, but the problem with this uh, cooperation is that uh, the Chinese institutions that develop the close ties with the uh, Georgian organizations uh, are usually listed in very high military and defense risk categories uh, that ultimately poses threats to the Georgian uh, national security. Um, moreover, uh, the Chinese authorities um, we uh, may seek this kind of cooperation uh, with Georgia on the CSO level uh, to use this ex exchange information uh, for its own intelligence needs. Uh, in the research, we have listed um, several uh, such institutions, either financed or um, the ones that uh, co uh, cooperate with China and establish close ties, uh, such as Georgia's uh, Georgia China Friendship Association, um, also National Natural Science Foundation of Georgia, um, and uh, Chinese Institute of International Education. Uh, as for the uh, economic ties, uh, I have to mention that uh, China has also um, boosted economic cooperation with Georgia and knowing uh, the China's lack of respect for democratic standards uh, justifies its inclination to shady dealings uh, with the local government officials. Of course, Georgia is not an exception. Uh, and in the report, we have listed uh, several Chinese companies um, with a dubious global uh, reputation uh, that are involved in Georgia's key infrastructural projects, uh, basically causing the harm to the country's na national and economic security. Um, moreover, uh, these companies are also blacklisted by the uh, international unities, such as, uh, for instance, World uh, Bank or a African Development Bank. However, um, the Georgian uh, government still keeps uh, um, creating and uh, establishing new ties with them. Uh, moreover, uh, I have to mention uh, that uh, regardless of this mass massive uh, amounts of uh, evidence of fraud and corruption scandals related to these companies, uh, the Georgian government never conducted the due diligence or uh, used those negative experiences for banning uh, the companies from state procurement tenders. Uh, and at last, uh, we have highlighted that um, during the pandemic, um, China has been also boosting the disinformation campaigns and uh, propaganda policies and activities in Georgia. Uh, we have listed also several examples, and one of them was uh, the Chinese ambassador's uh, speech regarding um, China's uh, effectiveness in early detection and prevention of the virus spread in China, uh, which has been aired in the several Georgian media outlets uh, without uh, any critical views or comments or analysis. Um, these precedents, as well as the um, already mentioned lack of uh, due diligence of the uh, local government, uh, contributes um, uh, to the positive uh, change concerning the general perception of China among the Georgian population, uh, while the, the reality shows us a different uh, scenario. Uh, I will stop here and I am looking forward to the questions. Thank you, Thank you, Annie. Thank you, all of you, for presenting your uh, chapters. Uh, now it's time for questions, and we are, uh, already received a number of questions, so I will start with those that are uh, related to the current situation in your country, and I will also try to group them a bit. So, there are similar, quite similar questions, for example, how uh, Russia can exploit the current situation in Georgia, and how the latest developments may influence uh, Georgia's path towards the EU and the NATO. So whoever would like to take the floor, please go ahead. I know that David wanted to already touch upon these things earlier, so maybe you would like to start. Uh, 
Sure. I just wanted to make a couple of remarks before answering the, this very interesting question, which is not uh, the answers to which is not quite clear yet for us as well, I guess. But first of all, I would like to mention that uh, during our presentations and within the research upon a very uh, wide range of topics, starting from economy, disinformation, and uh, we focused on malign, uh, foreign malign influence and their uh, tools and arsenal deployed in Georgia. But I would like to mention that it's not always a foreign actors who damage the Georgia's national security. And s sometimes we should al also look how the situation on uh, how the situation is going on within the country itself. So we are very used to blame always the foreigners, but sometimes there are big problems within the Georgian society and within Georgian politics as well. And I, I would like to say that the current political crisis in Georgia showed us how far the processes could go when the parties, and in this case, I mean the ruling Georgian Twin Party is unwilling to negotiate and to find the consensus and compromise. And the resignation of the prime minister of Georgia right this morning was also a clear example of that. As he said, and I'm not going to, uh, to analyze his true motives or why he did that and why this time, but what he explained and what he himself said was that he was unable to persuade his political team uh, to refrain from arresting the biggest, biggest opposition party leader, especially on the background of the political crisis which is happening in the, in the, in the country. So the existing political confrontation and polarization and lack of constructive dialogue creates a fertile ground for foreign malign actors to achieve their objectives. And I would say even without putting too much effort and resources in their endeavors, because the crisis and uh, this confrontation is already there. So there is not much left actually for foreign actors to do in Georgia, because the situation is it, it's alarming. And considering that Georgia is under Russian occupation, or currently we have a co economic crisis even due to the coronavirus, it's very severe economic crisis. And even at such times, half of the population, I mean, the supporters of the biggest political parties, which somehow represent the majority of Georgian population, sees each other as, as, as their enemies and vice versa. So the one group or the supporters of the United Nations movement sees the supporters of the Georgian dream as their enemies and vice versa. So this why it's it so hard to find a consensus and compromise in Georgia because we have a culture when they like this that they get all or nothing so they don't want just to divide their power to others and this political culture and i would say this democratic maturity contributes to the political crisis we are uh, experiencing right now and regarding the question of about the georgia's euro atlantic past of course this could be very damaging imagine like I'm Georgian and even for me, it's very hard and imagine you are someone observing Georgia from outside and you are seeing that the prime minister resigned and the leader of the biggest political parties under prosecution and he was almost arrested yesterday's evenings. I would imagine how terrible the picture looks like, especially from outside, but I hope uh, not to be very negative. I hope that uh, the situation uh, we, we get under the control and the parties will find the, some grounds for some common grounds for negotiation. Uh, and especially because the opposition uh, themselves this morning after the resignation of the prime minister, they say that they are ready to go back to the negotiation table. So I still have uh, hopes that this negotiation would somehow drag the country out of the political crisis. If needed, uh, we will have a snap or New, pol uh, new elections, I mean, the parliamentary election to overcome this political crisis somehow. Thank you. Thank you, David. Anybody else would like to complement to that? Maybe on that uh, possible role of Russia, how Russia can exploit the current situation? Even though I have not been the panelist, if, ah. if I have an opportunity to sure. jump in, I'll be glad to contribute. Yes, please go ahead, Mariam. Mariam from Grass. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for this event. Uh, my dearest uh, hello to, to my colleagues and especially uh, Mr. Mikiska, His Excellency. Really, really happy to be on the panel uh, 
in his presence also. And the questions that was posed, um, it, it, they are really relevant and interesting, of course, to answer. However, the picture that I personally see, and I'm sure many of my colleagues, as well as the majority of Georgians, no matter on which camp they are, the situation that we are looking at is, is really dramatic. And um, I don't want to be very pessimistic, but this time, uh, I think we are reaching a, a, a point where the uh, a resolution or a passage or exit from the deadlock is really hard to see. And the, uh, the, the threat that the ruling party uh, uh, executes the decision of the court, um, uh, even though has been delayed, according to the statement of the Ministry of Internal Affairs, it, it, it's still here. And I don't know, maybe within hours, it can be even implemented in real time. And what it means, as, as my colleague David was saying, is that uh, we, we may find, find out ourselves in a country where, where the chairperson of the uh, biggest opposition party is in jail, in pre-detential uh, uh, jail for the, for the really politically motivated um, case, I would say. I, I would not be you know, mild to, to emphasize this because we should all remember that uh, uh, the, the UNM's chair is, is sentenced uh, for, for, for the case that is connected to the, uh, to the events that took place in 2019 when uh, Russia's Duma representative sat uh, in the chair of the uh, Georgian Speaker's Parliament and when the, there was a big unrest and massive protest in, in front of the parliament. And the events that took place afterwards, we know that around more than uh, 30 or 40 journalists, for example, were injured. Many others uh, received really uh, tough damages and um, health damages uh, due, due to the disproportionate power that was expressed from the law enforcement bodies. And unfortunately, we only have uh, Nika Melia, the UNM's uh, chairperson, as the only person who who's... Uh, whose court hearings are going on uh, in the court. Therefore, the picture is really, really pessimistic. But I would like to go back to the question uh, how, how Russia can exploit uh, the situation. To be honest, I, I would say that uh, this is the situation in Georgia when Russia does not need to exploit anything more. Because we've known that Russia's uh, uh, malign intentions in Georgia, as well as in many other European countries, has been to divide the societies, to instill chaos, to instill confusion, to instill uh, chaotic situation and divisions in the country. And this is what we already have in Georgia. No matter who did that, the result, what we see in Georgia is entirely in Russia's interests and Russia's objectives for its uh, uh, neighborhood. Um, and one more uh, comment perhaps from my side, how, uh, how this affects Georgia's ambitions in European uh, institutions such as or structures such as NATO or, uh, or, or European Union. Uh, we should remember that it, is the, uh, it was the uh, ruling party who said that they would apply for Georgia's EU membership in 2024. And we should remember that that pro promise was also given uh, uh, by Poroshenko in Ukraine, uh, by some other parties in Moldova. This, this, uh, uh, this became, uh, I would say, a promise by which different political groups in, uh, in not-so-democratic countries try to, uh, try to buy uh, uh, votes. Uh, but it didn't uh, appear to be successful in Ukraine, in, in Moldova, I would say. Uh, and in case of Georgia, this would, uh, given the current situation, this would just stay as a mere promise uh, without any results or without it be becoming a realistic promise in, in 2024. And we have today an honor to, to, to have a uh, Czech ambassador here. And uh, I'm sure he, he would also uh, make some comments on that. But uh, becoming a member of European Union, we all know, uh, means that you have democratic institutions where there is no uh, politically motivated cases in the court against uh, oppositions and where there is no uh, prime ministers going home uh, knowing that there is somebody else 
uh, above him who makes actual decisions. And Kaharia's decision, uh, of course, proves that he, 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 he was not able to, uh, to make an agreement with the, uh, with the real decision maker in Georgia, that is, unfortunately, uh, the one who uh, is behind the scenes and behind the curtains. And um, yeah, on this uh, negative com uh, perspective, uh, I would say that we, we again and again rely on our Western par partners, of course, first of all, and then on the uh, true desire of uh, the Georgian public to, to make this country a democracy. Can I also briefly intervene here, if we have time? Yes, yes, Kimi, please go ahead. Um, thank you. Uh, first of all, I fully agree what my colleagues said about, uh, let's say, potential exploitation of this crisis by Russia and also the prospect of Georgia's uh, membership to the uh, European Union. Uh, first, let's start from Russian uh, angle of the story. Uh, and Mariam already underlined that this current political crisis has its roots, which is directly linked to uh, Russia. And that was Gavrilov's night, when uh, Russian MP um, ended up in our parliament and uh, the first uh, wave of protests erupted. Uh, but now, um, just last last month, we saw um, Navalny's arrest. And nowadays, we see some sort of replication of Navalny as a scenario in Georgia. So basically, Putin decided to uh, punish his key political opponent with uh, sending uh, him behind the bars. And uh, for Georgia and for uh, Georgian dream, um, that should have been some example to see what kind of protest then uh, Russian government faced after making such a decision. But despite of the fact that uh, we have the neighbor, which kind of is not democratic, and is doing uh, wrong things towards the, uh, the opponents um, of the political opponents, Georgian government is kind of replicating bad practices from uh, its neighbors. And this is already the exploitation of this conflict. And this is, and any kind of crisis in Georgia is for benefit of Russia. But on top of that, if Georgian government replicates Russian uh, bad practices, then this is something more beneficial for the, for the Kremlin. And regarding Georgia's aspiration uh, towards uh, European Union and how it can affect, um, the resignation of Georgian um, Prime Minister was quite telling in a sense that he announced openly that he did not agree uh, with his party over Nick Amelia's arrest. So the main uh, message from this uh, sentence is that uh, the attention of political opponents is not decided by judiciary, but this is decided by political party. So, the balance of power in our uh, political system is totally ruined. And if you place a bid for membership of the European Union, and if you have such profound problems in the country, then you should really do your homework first, and then you should kind of uh, have more ambitions. And if this homework isn't done in Georgia, then I think that the, the future and uh, Georgia's Euro Atlantic aspirations uh, are under kind of serious shadow. And, uh, I think that this is now up on the society to uh, fight for country's future, a better future, and also um, the European future. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin, very much. Uh, I don't know if Ambassador Mikiska would like to take the challenge that uh, Maria mentioned, that we, the Czech Republic, also have to do that homework, first of all, and how this uh, kind of, uh, how these EU standards are or can be apply to the current Georgia. I mean, I don't want to put you into kind of a, 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 a inconvenient position, but if you are ready to comment on that, uh, we would be happy to hear your thoughts. Yeah, well, thank you, Mariam. I understand your point perfectly. Uh, but, well, first of all, it needs a long time, you know, because we should elaborate uh, on this. Um, and I think that, well, um, a comment on, on what is going on right now uh, is it's it's quite delicate at this moment so i would prefer not to not to elaborate on that and you will understand it certainly that um, in at this moment my position would be a little bit difficult so any other time <laughs> 
Okay, thank you. Uh, in the meantime, we received a number of questions that are related actually to the mapping exercise. So let me uh, take uh, two of them. I think they would be uh, addressed to Annie and they are related to China. Uh, so what should be done in order to make the authorities uh, aware of this growing Chinese uh, presence and influence? That's one anonymous question. Then we have a question from uh, Miranda Bechwaya. Uh, do you think that you believe or do you expect that Chinese influence in Georgia will be growing in coming years and will it stay mainly in the field of economics or no? So these are these two questions, the authorities reactions to allowing China to extend their control of uh, here critical infrastructure and the second question related to uh, prediction of uh, Chinese influence in the future. Uh, well, thank you for the questions. Um, uh, I would um, answer the first one, the beginning. Um, uh, well, uh, I believe that uh, the uh, Chinese influence is go grow, uh, growing and it will grow in the future, obviously. Uh, uh, plus, uh, it won't be only associated with economy because uh, for me and for many others uh, who read um, a lot of information about China and its malign activities in different sectors, uh, they see that uh, all these sectors are interrelated. So. Um, most of the entities, uh, whether it's public or private, uh, they are uh, connected to the Chinese authorities. So I believe uh, that um, uh, this influence is grow growing also in Europe and it will grow here as well. Plus, um, the main point here is that um, China is focusing on the developing democracies because they are more fragile and um, they can be broken easily and they are well, uh, um, let's say corruption is uh, uh, more spread in these kind of countries rather than in uh, developed ones. Uh, so I believe that Georgia is uh, going to be uh, one of their key partner. Um, I, I don't know, For uh, at some point it could be good as well, uh, but uh, we need to also understand the risks associated with this kind of cooperation. Um, and can you remind me second question, please? Uh, the second question, uh, what the authorities should do uh, about the growing presence of China in the critical infrastructure projects? Well, I believe that the authorities, uh, first of all, uh, should feel the pressure coming from um, not only our Western partners, but also from the civil society organizations in Georgia, independent ones, obviously, not financed by China, of course. Uh, and um, uh, yes, I think the Western partners, if uh, uh, Georgia has set uh, the goal um, and Georgia wants to pursue the Western path, uh, obviously uh, it should focus uh, on alternatives rather than China. Um, and uh, West should play the key role uh, to, let's say, raise the awareness of the authorities and then of the Georgian population. No world. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Annie. Then there, is a, there are a few questions related to the definition of extremist groups. So there was an anonymous user who asked this question whether, how uh, would you define the extremist uh, groups and uh, how uh, is it relate, how they are related to the Georgian uh, church? Is there any evidence of these connections? And this question was addressed to Michael. Then uh, there was a, a similar question, I think, may probably addressed to Eto. Uh, if you could provide any evidence for that Alto Info's ties with Russia, uh, does it mean that any conservative platform which is criticizing liberal policy uh, means automatically being pro-Russian? So first, the definition of extremist groups, and then these two, I would say, detailed questions on the links with the church, and then the uh, a f matter of alto info and uh, being them per Russian. So I think, Michael, you can start. Yes, hello again. And uh, thank you for the interesting questions. Uh, yes, actually, we, we have some evidence that uh, the church uh, is connected to this uh, and 
uh, sometimes like the reacting uh, together. I've already mentioned the church connection to the extremist organization, uh, the uh, Union of Orthodox Parents, uh, uh, and uh, part some parts uh, of the organization, some members of the organization are clergy, so they uh, represent the radical position of the church. And also uh, here we have one uh, far right actor, uh, uh, far, uh, one far right actor who actually is uh, uh, friends, uh, very, very close friends with. Um, uh, Patriarch's local tenant, uh, Shio Mugiri, and he doesn't deny it. He is also uh, close friends with, um, he does not deny his friendship with Dugin, who is an ultranationalist Russian philosopher and who is the founder of uh, a regionist movement. And um, uh, on his side, uh, this uh, ultranationalist Russian philosopher also has links with uh, World Congress families uh, and uh, 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 together with the Russian oligarch Konstantin Malfoy, who financed the, and we can say financed the annexation of Crimea by Russia. Uh, this uh, has led to his name being added to the U.S. Uh, and uh, the U.S. Uh, EU, EU sanction list. So, um, according to this m m material, so Malfoy was also a central figure in the spread of Russian influence in European countries through uh, far right groups. So, uh, yeah, this is one of the evidence to like look at these uh, connections between the far right groups uh, and the church. Right. Uh, then maybe Eto, you might address that question. Yeah, sure. Of that linkage. Uh, sure. Regarding the far right, as I mentioned in the presentation, uh, alliance of patriots, uh, links between alliance of patriots and Russia are pretty clear, and they also have been investigated by some international organizations, uh, providing all the names and finances that they are receiving from Russia and all the support. Regarding Georgian March, uh, Estonian intelligence service report pointed out that there are links between Russia and Georgian March. As for uh, uh, groups, uh, far-right groups like Altinfo and other groups. Uh, we don't have uh, the Estonian intelligence report or a report by the Lithuanian intelligence service, but we have trends, we have narratives, and we have the actions of these groups and how do they behave. These groups have been mainly popular for their xenophobic, anti-Western, anti-liberal statements. Uh, and uh, so uh, just to understand the whole context, there are many far-right groups in Georgia but they have diversified their messages and their actions. If, for example, some far-right groups directly and openly endorse Russia, other far-right groups choose another tactics. They do not openly endorse Russia, and they are saying that Russia is occupier, Russia is a bad guy, but they are mobilizing uh, the negative sentiments uh, uh, related to anti-Western movement in Georgia. And everything that is happening in Georgia, which is related to anti-Western, anti-liberal, anti-democratic movements, of course, have back traces to Russia, uh, as witnessed by all the disinformation and other uh, influence operations. We don't have any Vietnamese or Burundi disinformation or influence campaigns in Georgia. According to all the strategic documents, Russia is a number one national security threat in Georgia, and uh, it, it has diversified. Um, so. There is no kinetic and physical war uh, um, held by Russia in Georgia. Of course, occupation is, but still, uh, the only thing that Russia is doing now are these influence operations, spreading corruption, spreading disinformation, helping to undermine rule of law, helping to undermine democracy. And these far-right groups all participate in this whole process that is either coming from the Kremlin or aligned with the Kremlin's interests. Right, thank you, Eto. Another question, I, I think it should be addressed to David uh, because it uh, concerns economy and trade. Three countries, Russia, China and Turkey, have been the top trading partners of Georgia uh, in the first half of the last year. How would you comment on that? Because these countries are mentioned in this uh, research uh, mapping the foreign influence. Sure. Uh, first of all, I would like to mention the previous questions very shortly regarding the Altinfo and the Russian ties. So, 
just two weeks ago, they had Alexander Dugin interviewed uh, on Alt Info, and if you just go and watch this one hour uh, TV program, that would be enough to disperse all the question marks regarding their ties with the Russia, because there was a very clear messages, pro-Russian messages, including that we should uh, push out the Western influence and Western organizations from Georgia and invite Russian organizations of Russian influence in Georgia because the situation in Caucasus region changed, especially after the Nagorno-Karabakh war. So just just watch for a few hours this the two programs of Alkinfo that would be enough to to find these ties, not the physical ties maybe, but I mean uh, their orientation and their policies. So regarding the economy, yes, uh, the trade with China is increasing significantly, and in 2020, they were, uh, the China became the top one country for the Georgian export. And of course, the uh, dependence on Turkey is also great, but why, why we are focused mainly on uh, Russia, I would try to explain also very briefly, it's because it's not only trade when it comes to Russia, they have also investment in uh, they are owning banks, they are owning petroleum uh, companies in Georgia. Also, most of the uh, tourists are coming from Russia. So overall, the dependence on Russian economy is significantly higher, and I would say it poses more threat than dependence on even, even on Chinese market, because uh, the past experience showed that Russia is not trustworthy or how they stable partner, because in 2006, for example, they imposed embargo on Georgian products, which was catastrophic for Georgian economy. And also in 2019, after the Gavrilov night, they also discussed uh, in Russian Duma to impose new embargoes on Georgian wine, which would be also catastrophic for uh, small Georgian businesses, especially in Kakheti region. So these two factor that on the one side, the, the Russian money and Russian investment are uh, presented in Georgian economy apart from the trade. And, and, and uh, on another part that Russia is not uh, stable or trustworthy partner, creates a significant threat to Georgia's economic development and security. So this is this is why we are focusing mainly on Russia because of this past experience. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, let's come back a bit uh, to that definition of the extreme groups. And I, I know that Tamar would like to add a few words on that. So please go ahead, Tamar. Uh, microphone, you have to unmute the microphone. Sorry, there were two questions. One was that uh, all conservative groups are extremists or all conservative groups are pro-Russian. Actually, uh, there are some groups uh, calling for violent actions and involved in violent actions affiliated either with church or we have Georgian march calling to expel all migrants or to create some kind police uh, to control uh, presence of foreigners in our country. And the uh, Orthodox uh, Union of Orthodox Parents associated with the Orthodox Church. And they were, were involved in violent actions, not only against LGBT groups, but against Jehovah Witnesses and other religious confessions. Uh, so uh, Orthodox Church tries to hide their official connections with these groups, but the members of these groups are cooperating with pro-Russian media outlets, News Front Georgia, uh, restricted by Facebook recently. They are producing their story and it shows their connections with Russia. Another topic on conservative groups and about Altinfo, uh, besides Dugin, uh, they are promoting the you know, different speakers, well known in Baltic countries and uh, other uh, post Soviet countries, and the supporters of Putin regime. And they are speaking in Sputnik, uh, Georgia, or Ukraine, or Baltic countries on behalf of Russia. All these people are speakers and interviewed by Altinfo without any criticism. So these content related topics, I remember when we started monitoring the Alliance of Patriots and people were asking whether they have some connections with Russia. We, we, we identified the 
the messages were familiar to the programming actors and then after the elections they openly spoke about the need to go to Kremlin and uh, to change Georgian foreign policy. So this content, as Eto mentioned, this content indicates that they are actually fulfilling and uh, implementing the Russian goals and indirectly without uh, positioning themselves as a supporters of Kremlin. I know, I know that Kiwi also would like to address this issue. So the floor is yours. Yes, indeed. Um, I think that it's very important to uh, explain more in, uh, the, regarding the links of Altinfo and um, Russia. Because basically, um, we all understand that uh, if any uh, like actor in Georgia says openly that this they, they put forward some pro-Russian interest in the country, it's very kind of disadvantages for them because uh, they will never mobilize uh, people around them. And, and um, that's why I think it's always important to um, read between the lines and then compare uh, the statements they make and also statements we hear from, from the Kremlin. And uh, David uh, already mentioned that you need to uh, uh, kind of watch their um, daily shows uh, a few hours and probably uh, will become more understandable what what links are we talking about? And I just want to uh, um, kind of quote a couple of statements from Altinfo uh, that they made, and then let's compare it with Russian uh, statements. For example, uh, once in their uh, daily video, Georgian uh, sorry Altinfo said that uh, Georgia does not have a luxury to choose between Russia and the West because Russia will inevitably conquer Georgia. So if you compare this statement with what Russia is saying, or Russian officials are saying, they are both instilling fears that uh, you will inevitably be conquered and you have no choice. So don't really try to aspire towards the West. Or another statement that um, I just recall is that uh, the Altinfo says that the West will never protect Georgia. And Russian threat is so big that no one has time to take care of Georgia or provide any tangible assistance. This is again in line with uh, what Kremlin is saying about Georgia, that the, the, the partnership between Georgia and West is something ephemeral and non-existent. And then after this, they try to um, convince people that the only way um, that Georgia can uh, kind of save itself is to um, start dialogue with Russia. And um, uh, when I saw one of the videos in Altinfo, um, uh, they said that uh, basically we should talk to Russia to maintain at least some sort of uh, uh, autonomous uh, kind of status until it's too late. So these three statements, I think, really uh, explicitly show uh, this convergence between Altinfo and Russia, and then probably it leaves less questions uh, whether they are uh, connected to each other or they are kind of really uh, different from each other and uh, not, not having any uh, at least um, ideological uh, convergence or something along these lines. Yes, thank you, Givi. And uh, I would like to thank to all of you because again, it was so interesting to listen to you to, to see how much knowledge you have and how clearly you are able to explain the things uh, to people from outside of georgia so we are very happy that we have you there on ground and that we can be your partners i mean we the european values and having said that uh we will f finalize our today's talks here and uh, we'll definitely continue to focus on these issues. And what uh, Ambassador Mikiska mentioned, that we might look at the means how to tackle that foreign line influence, how to move to the next level. This is something that uh, we will definitely uh, continue and we hope to do it together with you. And I would also like to thank you to all of those who asked the questions. I think they were quite relevant and quite interesting. And uh, yeah, let me wish you all a, a nice day and uh, having and uh, let's hope that the next days would bring some good news to all of us especially to you who are in georgia and uh, let's hope for 
a good outcome of all that situation that you have there. So thank you very much and stay healthy, stay safe and talk to you next time. Bye-bye.